Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be here today and we will try to keep it as upbeat as we can, um, but it is, you know, we are fashioning a funeral. So let me just keep that in mind. So a little bit about uh, what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna share a little bit about myself. Um, I've called the next part Morning 101. So a little bit of background in the morning culture and the morning arts that sort of developed from that culture. Um, we're gonna focus a lot on morning fashion and then lastly, the business of morning. And you'll see what I mean by that. So I'm Kelly White. You see my maiden name is Wenner, which some of you who are from the area will be familiar with. Um, I grew up right here in Lovettsville. My mom still lives here. Um, you can read about my ancestor, Elder Wenner, who founded this very church or helped found this very church. So I'm really excited to be here and honor my family in that way. Um, as Rich mentioned, I am a dress historian and I have my undergraduate and graduate degrees both in history. Um, my the majority of my experience is in museum and education, but what a fashion historian does is they study what people wore, but also why they wore it and who made it and how they made it, where they bought it. Um, what, what, was, what was unique about what that person wore? I mean, if you think about it, we all have special occasions in our lives where we've worn something special. Think about like a wedding dress that has its own history. Um, so morning has its own fashion history as well. Uh, Rich mentioned all the things that I love to volunteer to do. Um, I love to write and I do collect and sell vintage clothing, not morning clothing, but um, I don't, uh, it's hard to come by, honestly. <laughs> but um, I do love all eras of vintage clothing. Um, I love just studying what people wore and like I said, how they wore it. And I do have a full-time job. I'm a research analyst at American Public University System. Um, for some of you who heard uh, Rich talk about AMU, that's the parent of yeah, that institution. So I have a lot of hats that I wear. <laughs> and again, I'm so glad that you're all here today to talk about this topic that I love so much. And I'm curious to know, um, and you can just, it's very informal. So I just would like to hear first, but what words come to your mind when you talk about morning. Black. The others? Veil. Okay. The good one. <laughs> All those things. All those things are true. <laughs> um, but my goal today is to see if by the end of, of our interaction here today, if I can get you to think of some other words that you think of when you think about Victorian and Civil War era morning. So everybody always asks me, why do you like mourning? It's so sad. What is it about that that you like to study? And for me, um, I've mentioned that I, you know, I love that my family history and genealogy. And for me, that really reson resonates, resonates <laughs> with etiquette and traditions. And um, that are, those are just some things that are really fascinating to me. Um, when I think about tradition and sort of rules and rites and rituals, it brings me closer to what their world might have been like. And that's just sort of what interests me in any time period, really. But knowing that I did have Civil War ancestors here, it makes me think about what their life might have been like. Um, I also love the Civil War in general. So I think a lot of times when we um, hear about Civil War history, a lot of times it focuses on soldiers and battlefields and war, but there are so many other elements to social history that are important in how people lived during that time. Um, my master's degree for the, my thesis actually wrote about Quaker abolitionists in Loudoun County. So just thinking about their experience, not as a soldier, not in a war, because um, they were conscientious objectors, I just am fascinated by what I call the well-rounded experience. So that's a little bit about why morning. Um, so we'll just go on to morning 101. So this lovely lady is Queen Victoria. <laughs> um, in 1861, Queen Victoria's husband died of typhoid. 
Um, and she immediately went into what we're gonna, you'll understand is full mourning. Um, she stayed that way for the next 40 years of her life. Now the average Queen Victoria, <laughs> England. <laughs> no, no problem, no problem at all. Um, she chose to do that. That was not a rule. So, um, but she did in doing so um, influence the fashion and the social norms of her time. Um, at, as with all, almost all American fashion at that time, the trends followed Europe. So they're looking to her, they're looking to royalty, to what to wear. Um, things like Godet's Ladies Book and La Mode Illustrée were publications that were um, what you might hear fashion plates. They had fashion plates of what people were wearing and Queen Victoria is always wearing black. She's always um, in mourning. So this becomes sort of a, I don't want to say in vogue, but they're looking to her to sort of see that norm um, in a way that we might think of like today's Vogue or Glamour magazines, that same sort of way. You might not do it every day, but you're going to see it a lot. Um, she is also very big into etiquette. So again, we're going to follow what she's doing because America likes to follow other uh, fashion and etiquette from London and France. So and then if we think about it, um, actually, I'm going to go to the next slide. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, sorry. The 1861 was a strange time for America because so many things were happening. Germ theory was not really a huge thing. So life and expectancy was very, very short. Um, it was around 40 years old in 1860. Um, infant mortality was very high because we were not... We were learning, but we weren't quite yet there as far as how diseases spread, how to help people who are sick. Um, and then if you add to that, in 1861, what happens? The Civil War begins. And the next four years are going to take about two and a half, two point five percent of the then population. It's a large number of people um, who are passing away. And everyone is experiencing this loss either at home or because their loved ones are in the war um, and it's just a little um it, it creates what drew gilpin faust calls a republic of suffering so in addition at that time the funeral itself is starting to change um, before the civil war era uh, people usually passed away at home. They may have had a caregiver um, there at the house with them. Um, they, When they did pass away, that caregiver would take care of the body at home um, by washing, and, and um, they may have someone come in with cooling boards and cooling mechanisms to keep it cool until people could come and visit. Um, and you were likely buried close to home. If you if you were wealthy and you lived on a large estate or plantation, you might have a family plot at your home. Um, or a lot of times uh, your church might have had a churchyard where you were buried. And you see that a lot around here, um, which is I don't know, kind, of, <laughs> kind of nice that you know, everybody's all together. But <laughs> um, again, with advances in science and medicine, um, the rural cemetery really starts to pop up. So around 1830 in America, we start to see the first, um, I'll call them garden cemeteries that are very landscaped that people visit. They want to go visit their loved ones outside of the area. Um, that you will often see images of picnics in cemeteries. It was a place of repose. They wanted to go and be with their loved one. Um, and that really catches on um, as people, as the cities are starting to expand a little bit. And there are more and more casualties because people are, they are starting to think about, are we putting things in the ground we don't want to expose ourselves to? Um, so let's get this out of the city for health reasons and sanitary reasons, but also because it's becoming sort of a vogue thing to do, to go and visit um, as a family. And of course, during and after the war, all the battlefield casualties, we have to do something with all of the deceased. And this becomes an issue with um, transportation. How are we going to get people 
okay, now we're dying at home when we need to go to a cemetery. People are dying away from home and they need to either get home or to a cemetery. So there's all kinds of needs that are popping up as far as um, the changing funeral, how we're approaching taking care of our, of our loved ones when they die. Um, the funeral itself becomes more elaborate. Um, some funerals required an invitation. You can, I've seen uh, there are <laughs> mourning cards where that was your invitation to the funeral. Um, you didn't get one. Didn't have one. So <laughs> people spent a lot of money on having a funeral because it was it was a, um, a demonstration of how much they loved their loved one. So all of these things are really working together to change how people approach how they mourn. So that leads to what I call mourning's big four. Now I've hinted a little bit at what they are um, and I've stolen the big four from the first big four accounting firms, <laughs> but, <laughs> I know. but, but um, my big four that I see um, that I have looked at and studied are transportation and storage. We mentioned a little bit about the changing funeral and some needs there. Medicine, again, we've talked a little bit about the changing needs of, of medicine um, and caring for our dead. Um, arts and crafts, and of course, my favorite, fashion. So we will start with, oh, you're fine. Yes, transportation and storage. Um, as we talked about a little bit, if you are going to pass away at home and need your body to get to a cemetery, or if you're away from home and you passed away on the battlefield, um, you'll need to be transported. Uh, so a lot of bodies in the war were actually transported on the train, but locally, these uh, types of, what they're calling funeral cars, we would call hearses today, um, this one's horse-drawn, um, they become very, very elaborate. I'm gonna show you just this, I, don't you, I was gonna point this out because we sell coffin at live and let live prices. Someone here, Mr. Door has a quite a sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> um, but you can see how elaborate this, um, <laughs> this purse. Thank you, right? We bury the dead day almost, almost daily. Um, he's storing them somewhere apparently. <laughs> oh, I'm never, never keeping this line hard. Um, <laughs> but we're also seeing um, elaborate coffins and caskets. Um, these are craftsmen who are typically, they started out making cabinets, so they know how to work wood, they know how to make it beautiful, um, and also functional. So this is giving a new life to people who have this sort of trade. And so that is our first type of business. And when I say storage, I actually mean coffins and caskets, of course. Um, so here we have another, I'm going to use this little corner because I just want to. We have this beautiful, um, I'll call it a hearse, funeral car. Um, you can see it's made in Ohio. There is an actual museum called the Funitorium, if you're interested in this, they demonstrate all of these. They have a huge collection of, of hearses. Um, but you can see just the elaborateness of it from the finials to the lamps. Um, and then this one over here, same period. Um, didn't know, I think this one's from Kentucky. I forgot to note where it's actually from. Um, does anyone know the difference between a coffin and a casket? Casket. Casket, body shape. The shape. The coffin is body shaped, right? So you have that little, the toe box is thinner has the shaped sides, um, and then a casket. I call it like the ho-ho shape. <laughs> I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> see, the, that might be your word that you think of now is ho-ho. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll bring it back, I promise. Um, and then, Tracy's such a heckler. You can't take her anywhere. Uh, <laughs> The middle coffin here is made of metal. It's called the Fisk coffin. And you can see it has a, a face plate here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, more about the Fisk on the next slide. Um, but I also wanna point out that during this time, I know it, it's very, it's um, modeled after the sarcophagus. So you can kind of see that inspiration there. 
Um, but the other important part about the development of the coffins and caskets of this time was because we are advancing medicine, there is a need for bodies. And people are terrified of body snatching and um, their gravesite being burglarized. So if you look through ads during this time, you'll see a lot of um, burglar proof coffins right. and caskets um, because people don't want to be, they, they want their loved ones uh, you know, to rest in, in peace. They don't want to be, yeah, not pieces, exactly. They don't want to, they want to uh, experience that. Um, it was a very real concern for them. Uh, so much so that um, there was a patent for what was called a life detector, not a lie detector, a life detector. And what that was, was a, it was a, a mechanism that would go um, inside of the coffin or casket. And um, if the deceased were buried alive, which was another big concern because of medicine at the time, um, they could pull the, ring the bell. They could ring the bell, a little latch would open and give them some air and hopefully, you know, someone would come help. But I have to tell you, and this is just sidebar, but I study this stuff. It doesn't scare me. None of it scares me. But if I'm walking through a cemetery or graveyard and I hear a bell, it's going to have the opposite effect. I'm not going to stop the help. So that that just to me was bad design because I'm just not, I'm not, I'm going to run. So <laughs> but it was initially intended to, oh my gosh, buried alive, please help down here, ring, ring the bell. Um, I've never seen one. Obviously they didn't last because of I don't believe so. I didn't read any. Was it real? Well, yeah. Oh, people were buried alive, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Oh, my word. Yeah, she had clawed her way out. The life the, with the bases and the bells. Interesting, interesting. I, I wasn't aware, I knew people were buried a lot, but I wasn't aware that there were cases that were. <laughs> wow, okay. Medicine is not my. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're not kidding, right? That's right. <laughs> Embalmed. Yeah. Sure. Not yet. Embalming is still becoming a thing. Not yet. Right. <laughs> That's for a woman. Wow. Wow. No, she wouldn't have been in, involved yet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's what I'm understanding. Oh, that's terrible. It is like an Ed Brown post right here. Go see. Yeah. Oh, wow. Here in Loudoun. Yeah. Mm hmm Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. 
Oh, absolutely. Yes. There was a big need for cadavers. Dig them up. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So these are these are real real fears, of course. And we know, you know, marketing marketing speak for yourselves. So even if it's just one thing, um, but we do know they were bad. <laughs> um, so just talking a little bit more about the fits, um, the metallic coffin with the faceplate that did slide open um, for identification or like um, we mentioned to to sort of check to be sure that you were actually dead. Um, these seem really logical, right? Like, oh, it's gonna be airtight and bugs won't get in and we can transport them, um, but they weren't perfect. So um, when they were used for something like identification because embalming was still being thought of and developed, you may get your loved one and open this plate and see something you really were not <laughs> expecting. Um, so that was not, um, I cannot imagine the, just the, the thought of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> the fifth got a pretty short lifespan because Mr. Fisk himself had a, had a short, unfortunate, unfortunately short lifespan. Um, and when he sold his, his rights to his brothers, um, when they took over after he died, they didn't really do much with it. And not to mention, it was um, it wasn't hugely popular because it was very expensive. On average, it would cost about four times more than a normal um, coffin or or a ho ho casket. But <laughs> um, so it just it really didn't take off too much, except among the wealthy. Um, when it was developed, Dolly Madison was actually built uh, buried in a this. Tracy, <laughs> know that, <laughs> um, and uh, that was of course before. But the um, if you want to see one, and this is local, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick actually has a good exhibit on one. They have one there in case you can see it, and it's right next to um, their exhibit about embalming. So you can learn a lot about all of the advances in embalming, which I'm going to talk about very slightly because medicine is not really my Forte, but um, that does provide us a nice segue. So, as we've talked about, um, we have the need for embalming now because we're not having people over to our homes when our loved ones pass away. We might wait a few days. Um, our loved ones are dying on the battlefield. They need to be transported, but that's not immediate. So there's this need um, for embalming. And... Um, of course, we know now that the Egyptians embalmed, but they were uh, the people of Victorian and Civil War era, America. They were not fully aware of, of all of the advances that the Egyptians had known about yet. Um, think about it. The late 1800s, people become really fascinated by Egypt. But then in the 1920s, um, we go as archaeologists with the tomb. So we learn a lot more about those um, advances in science that we didn't quite yet know about. Um, but yeah, they basically dehydrated, right? But that was that's the first step in embalming. Yeah, is 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 taking all the blood out. So that was basically what that. So um, this provided another, I will say, avenue for uh, a business to expand. The coffin and cabinet makers that we talked about. They're starting out as cabinet makers. Now they can make coffins. Now they can make um, now they can make hearses or funeral cars. And now they can actually go and add embalming to their line of work. If going to a, a college, maybe there's one in Philadelphia. I'm not really sure about that one. So don't put one. But they could expand their business to include all of these things and become sort of a one-stop shop of 
we can buy your casket here and we'll embalm your body and we'll get your burial robes and just all these things. So I, that probably sounds pretty familiar to us because that sounds like a funeral home. You have a one-stop shop where everything is happening. Um, so you can see sort of that advancement. Like we had these little sort of pocket things and they're all coming together as one sort of unit that people are starting to offer as a service. This ad is from Richmond um, and he's saying he'll repair your furniture and um, he will have caskets and burial robes that, and he will promptly attend to you day or night. So if the furniture breaks and your loved one dies, you're in really good hands with Mr. Wood. Um, any more questions of our conversation about transportation and storage? I'm going to move on, or medical actually. I'm going to move on to arts and crafts. So these lovely ladies, I love this photo. Um, they are what's called flower ladies. And they had a job very similar um, in stature to our modern day pallbearers. So if you think about a pallbearer, they're usually someone that's very close to the family. Um, and it's, it's quite an honor for someone to ask you to be uh, the pallbearer in someone's service. It was the same for with these ladies. Um, their job was to take all of these flower arrangements to the cemetery. So wherever you're having this service, that's their job. They're gonna gather them up, you're gonna take them to the cemetery, rearrange them to look, to look beautiful. Um, of course, flowers are a thing. Um, originally, because when we did have services at home, the body is decaying and it's, of course, giving off the smell. And so flowers like lilies, things that's, that are, have a very heady and heavy scent, um, are used to perfume the home to sort of mask that. Um, and that's just something that stays with people. The Victorians had a whole language of flowers um, that they, they love to have um, things, you know, sent to their friends or things that you know, white might mean you're my friend and red is I love you, but flowers are really big to them. And so that really sticks, that really stays with them. Um, and the next is kind of an interesting topic to me. Um, it's hair jewelry and hair wreaths. And yes, it is human hair. <laughs> I get that asked all the time. <laughs> um, I have a funny story that when, uh, I think Tracy probably remembers all of the hair work the lab museum has. Um, I did work there um, many years ago. <laughs> and uh, when I started working there, it was in October. And every October, they bring out all of their hair work for hauntings. The people would come in, and it's sort of creepy and spooky. And I was so terrified of it. I didn't even want to turn on and off the lights. Like, I was just like, OK, I'm leaving. Uh, hey, guys, I'm leaving. And I'm leaving lights on in here. <laughs> so I just didn't want to. I didn't want to have anything to do with that room. Um, I don't know why it creeped me out so bad. I just did. <laughs> So, um, so these are just an example of the hair work. We have a wreath here um, made entirely of human hair. This one's very simple. You can see the braids on the outside, and then just the simple braid in the middle and the and the bow. This one's a little little elaborate in a shadow box. They're so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Did they have something to do with the, the morning or? They did. So if you think about, and this is what kind of helps me not feel so creeped out about it, but um, people believed that there were like, there was a life force. So if you think about it now, I mean, if you have children and you get them for their first haircut, you might keep a lot. Of hair. Or, you know, in, in the Edwardian period, that was like a symbol of love. You keep a lot of my hair. You know, I promise that that I'm yours. And they really, they it was very symbolic to have like someone's hair. Like it contained their sort of life essence a little bit. Mm -hmm. They want their hair. Yeah. Yes, there was a market for um, uh, you. It became so popular that people wanted hair of, of just their loved ones. They didn't have to be deceased. Um, but this, the the majority of the business here was hair of the deceased. Yeah. 
and it, it just I just try to think about it that way, you know, that like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if this is something that interests you, I'll just point this out. There. Ooh, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can talk about that? <laughs> Might have, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In a locket, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. I do too. I do too now. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, it's And to your point too, I wanted to point out, um, it's actually coming really back into fashion. I know that sounds really uh, you know, weird, but there um, are several, if, if you're interested, I'll, I didn't, I didn't put them in the slide, but there are several, um, I'll call them groups, um, Victorian hair workers that offer both in-person and online trainings of, of different methods of, of making this type of art. Um, they use horse hair, or you can use, they use human hair if you like, or wigs, whatever you're comfortable with. But if you do, um, if you're really into this, there are people who will teach you how to do this today. And they use, um, there was a, I guess you'd call it an instructional manual. There was, they used that same one. So you're using the same methods that you would have used in 1850s, 60s, 70s. And they'll teach you how to do this. And it's fascinating. I have not done it. I tried to sign up, but um, life got in the way and <laughs> I didn't get to do it. But I actually, that's on my list of things to do is, is to learn this craft. Um, Cause I think it's fascinating. And um, one of the things about it too, is that um, it became another uh, business because jewelry makers and um, repair shops could have this as another service that they offered. Send us your loved one's hair and we will send you back a locket or um, a wreath, whichever the case may be. Um, nine times out of 10, it was a woman in the back doing the work and the, the male shop owner selling this as a service. So I sort of see that as a cottage industry for uh, women crafts, um, crafts people. So, um, just to, so you know, the, I just wanted to point out the sources. Here, I did get some of these off of Pinterest and then from the Kentucky Historical Society. But um, like I mentioned, the Loud Museum does have some that I think they still do bring out at hauntings. And um, the one I think is a clock, if I remember correctly, it's really big, um, but it's beautiful. Now that that, now I think it's beautiful. Um, and then the, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Boonesboro um, Museum of History in Boonesboro, Maryland. That museum is actually in an old funeral home, and they do have uh, several exhibits of, of morning hair work in there, and they're beautiful, along with a lot of other um, funeral artifacts, because it was a, a working funeral home. So um, if that interests you, I encourage you to go there. Their collection is huge, so <laughs> I just want to tell you, it's a large place. Um, so we talked a little bit about the hair and the hair wreaths, the hair lockets. Um, but there's also another side of mourning jewelry uh, that was made from jet. People have talked about this a lot, jet black, jet, jet, jet. Um, but it was also made of basically anything that would become hard and dark in color. <laughs> so um, bog oak, gutta percha, um, anything that would harden that someone could carve. And you can see here, this one in the middle is Whitby Jet. Whitby Jet is the most sort of popular or famous jet. There is a whole museum of Whitby Jet. There's a nice website um, all about it. This one in the middle is um, Jet. I think this one on the right is, I think that one's Bog Oak. 
and I can't remember what this one's made of, but there's all different kinds. Anything that'll get dark. Um, but you can see the elaborate carvings and there's symbolism in all of these carvings. Um, if you are interested in this, this is really what we love about mourning. I highly encourage you to visit The Art of Mourning. Um, it's run by a gentleman named Hayden Peters. He is a fantastic speaker. He speaks all over. You can see some of his archived um, presentations, but he's also a collector of this type of um, hair work and the morning jewelry. His, uh, he's just a wealth of knowledge and he will share it and he will always write you back if you have a question. Uh, but he's a fantastic speaker, so I highly encourage you to visit that website if that is what you think um, you love. His website is beautiful, so be prepared to sit for hours and just go through all of these different things. And um, I just really plug him a little bit. Um, also, there are all kinds of places you can get reproductions. I'm actually wearing a reproduction today um, that's supposed to look like bog oak. If you're interested in not collecting real jewelry, but purchasing some reproductions, um, it's the Museum of the Very Strange. They have an Etsy and their prices are super reasonable. If you just like the way it looks and you really don't want to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars and search all over for this jewelry. Um, but in saying that it is highly collectible. So it still is a business today. I mean, you can spend hundreds of dollars on a little teeny brooch um, because it was so uh, prevalent in the time, but not so prevalent now. So you won't come buy it um, other than lots of times in the museum. So. Um, We'll talk a little, a teeny little bit more about jet when we get to fashion, but a little bit about that. And then the next piece of arts and crafts, um, I will call it, are gravestones and monuments. And I think being around here, we are very lucky that we have so many cemeteries where the, we can see some of this beautiful artwork. Um, you can see all the symbolism, this Gothic arch here, the urn with the, yes, there, there's tree trunk ones. Um, I'm not sure where you went, but there's some at Mount Olivet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. New Jerusalem, uh-huh, yeah. They have a fascinating story that goes back to, um, uh -huh. oh, hey. that's so neat. So that all comes together for you. <laughs> uh, but they were pieces of art. I mean, these are really before, like I mentioned, you might be buried in the churchyard with a, you know, an arch, had your name inscribed on it. Might still be there, not sure. Um, but these are really pieces of art. People went through um, lots of money paying for uh, these outward expressions of love for their loved ones. Um, full of symbolism, like I mentioned, the tree. Um, I don't know the full story, but I believe it's something with the woodsman. That's a kind of like a Mason's type group. Um, but the, oh, <laughs> um, but they, um, like I mentioned, the Mount Olivet Cemetery here locally is a treasure trove of these types of. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I just think they're so beautiful. I don't know. <laughs> yes, the art. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. Was, yeah, me too. <laughs> um, the sort of evolution of this sort of tree trunk idea is, is later in the 1890s. Um, people wanted to sort of get the symbolism back to the human's relationship with nature. And that was sort of symbolic of that um, and celebrating their life, which again, I'm kind of seeing another evolution starting to happen there of, of the funeral and eulogy and, and the symbolism. Um, the um, Here's a bonus word for you. If you love to study cemeteries, graves, and funeralia, you are a tapophile. So, <laughs> There are whole societies of people who are tapophiles that you can join online. Um, and I, yeah, I find that sort of fascinating. So, um, so those are my notes about. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. I love all of these symbols. I think this the, the willow is probably my favorite. That one's a little bit older. Um, we see those in the in the colonial period too, but I just, I don't know. I could walk around for hours and just look at it. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. their photo, their photo, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or did it ever leave? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're, we're all we're all still Victorians, really. <laughs> it is. No, I love it. Keep going. <laughs> um. So the next topic I'm going to just very, very briefly touch on um, that our friend in the back mentioned was the postpartum photography. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into this and there's a reason for that. Um, I find some of this a little bit overwhelming um, looking at it over and over and over. And I don't, I don't feel that I necessarily by the description of the talk would have prepared you for it um, because it can be just a little much seeing it over and over. Um, but I did find, or I did include, I'm sorry, this beautiful photo of this young woman and her um, her deceased infant and uh, the way that she's looking lovingly. And this may have sometimes been the only time anyone ever had a photo, as you mentioned, um, because it was expensive. It was the, the um, everything was new about photography. So not everybody just had access to it, but they did want to take photos of their deceased loved ones. Um, so these are my, <laughs> so if you are, yeah, um, so if you are interested in this, I do highly recommend the book Beyond the Dark Veil. It is, uh, you can get it on Amazon, and it's the, the people who run the website, the Thanatos Archive, um, they are the publishers of that book, and you can, for a very small fee, become a member of their website, and they will show you their entire treasure trove. Um, the beauty of just paying the little small fee is that they do an enormous amount of research to weed out the fakes. And I know that sounds really crazy that, oh, what, well, you know, how, why would there be fakes? But even like we mentioned in the media, even in, even in the uh, Civil War era, um, there were, there, there does need a, a, an eye on those that knows what they're looking for to be sure that you, you are seeing what you're seeing. And if you do like to collect these, there are huge um, groups of collectors the Thanet, people at Thanatos Archive will help you validate something if you are looking to purchase because they can be very expensive. Well, it's interesting. I was researching a friend who gave me a bunch of photographs and went through the photographs. Mm hmm. No idea who he was. So, hold on. So, come to find out, it turned out to be her cousin. Because she has the hand on the picture that she had danced all of her. Oh, wow. I had a good year for me. I actually. And um, we had to buy this big hat. Wow. So, it was a real. No, no, no. 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 She had been there. Her daughter died by accident. She walked up the stairs. Oh. Um, but we didn't have a recording of that trial, so we didn't even know that trial existed. How sad. How sad. No, there was no scandal. No, she had the child died. It was never been mentioned. Later, after the child died. So um, that we wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have put her in the database. Right. Yeah. You know, so without that phone. Mm -hmm. So they are they are very special, you know. To think about it, um, and like I mentioned, there are um, they're out there to purchase. Just be sure you are not purchasing fakes. I would hate for, I would hate to think that someone was pulling that over on on someone. I hate that anyway. But that just seems like a really sensitive thing, and um, 
<laughs> yes, please. If you do keep family photos, label them because that makes the, the researcher's job much, much easier. Um, so this fun word, Thanatos, um, it may not be a word that you hear every day. So I just gave you a little bit. This is a little another bonus word, um, Thanatology, the scientific study of death and the practices associated with it, including the study of the needs of the terminally ill and their families. Um, another little extra side note, if this is something that really um, speaks to you about working with families of the deceased, um, Hood College in Frederick has a wonderful thanatology program where you can become a certified death counselor. Um, they have a summer program where it's, uh, I, mean, I wanna say it's like six, four or six weeks, it's very fast, um, but it's world, it's the only one in the country like that. Um, and it's very well um, spoken of. So if that is something that sort of sparks something in you um, to, to work with the families of the deceased, I really encourage you to, to look them up. <laughs> oh, do you? Oh, bless you. <laughs> I just find that, I mean, that, I just, a death doula, a death cafe, but I just think that's, it's very special to, um, means a lot to families to have someone who is there with them. And I think that's what a lot, all of this really is, right? I mean, it's, it's an outward symbol. Um, so moving on <laughs> to our last of the big four. No, 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 absolutely not. Um, my favorite topic is fashion. Drive called Fifty Shades of Black. A little tongue in cheek, but, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but um, this lovely or maybe not, we don't really know, lady um, here is in what we would call full mourning. She is wearing her full veil. Um, everything but her hands are covered, um, so we know she is in what we call the first stage of mourning. Um, you can see in her hand she's holding. I think it's a parasol here too, um, which is also black. Um, love black. I love black. Um, <laughs> so they uh, have black. Um, why black though? Um, there are a number of superstitions that people talk about, um, but to the Victorians or Civil War era Americans, that was an outward expression of their spiritual, um, what was going on spiritually in life. Um, they had lost a loved one. So it was really just an outward demonstration of their inner feelings. Um, lots well, of. The big thing is that the, the widow or the immediate family was a black. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. Then. Right. We still wear black to people, like every day. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> um, black was. Uh, until about the mid 1850s, when the process of dying really started to get solidified, um, or aniline dyes and you know, advice for your dying. Um, but those were made from um, coal tar. Those were the things that would like really adhere to the fabric. But before that, um, the earlier dyes might contain things like arsenic, uh, things that were not good for you, or they may have been made from natural materials. Um, anything that you could make dark, uh, acorns, holes, roots. Um, if you see some of the, uh, if you were to come upon some pieces of clothing um, that are starting to fade more to brown, they really are a dark brown. Like your eyes interpreting them as black, but they were probably in, in life likely a dark brown. And that's why they're fading in that way. Um, so they're probably a little bit earlier than the, than the dying process that would be in the mid to late 1890s that came um, to into you know into more fashion, lots of purples and things like that too. Um, but on that note, if you were to collect or come across uh, articles of clothing that were black in this period, the the standard of caring for clothing is to just have clean, dry hands, no rings. Um, I usually wear gloves if I'm touching something black because you don't know. You really don't know what it's dyed with, and you're you're not really protecting the clothing so much as you're protecting yourself. And that's what I would always tell people who would come in and help us um, with cataloging things. Is, things is that, um, yeah, the standard is wash your hands, dry them, no rings. But if you want to protect yourself, I would wear gloves. That was just my little PSA for if you do uh, come across um, some actual antique uh, morning clothing. 
Um, and speaking of dyes, I wanted to point this out too, it's a, it's a Civil War crowd. Um, Confederate uniforms were actually dyed with butternuts and that earned them the nickname of butternuts, which I'm sure they really loved because they were trying to be big soldiers. Um, <laughs> but um, that was butternuts mixed with uh, like a mordant that would make it adhere and be gray. So just an interesting, if you're interested in dyes, I just think it's really fascinating how dyes. Is walnut? Yeah. yeah. So. And walnut uh, is continues to be. Yeah, absolutely. There's all kinds of. I would, I don't know. I really don't know. I have an allergy to nuts, but I've never, I've never held those clothes. So I don't, without, I usually wear gloves anyway. I just wear it that way. So <laughs> um, it could be, it could be. Absolutely. Um, so gosh, I'm, I thought I was going to go fast, but I'm like, I'm keeping here a long time. <laughs> um, so I will go through these. Um, the next few, we're going to talk about quickly the stages of mourning. <laughs> I don't want to keep you too long if you need to use the restroom or anything like that. Um, there are, you could research a um, couple different sources and find different um, averages, but these are sort of the typical averages. Um, a widow for a husband, a year and a day to life. I love that saying a year and a day. I think that sort of brings it. Um, I think that's probably like the lower end of the average, um, but a long time. You're going to have to mourn for a long time. You've probably seen it in um, If You've Loved Gone with the Wind, where she is wearing her mourning and she just doesn't want to even <laughs> have it, but they make her wear it for so long. Um, and then a widower, three to six months, but it was typically the three. Um, and sometimes it was just an armband. I mean, we're really putting. Putting them in out a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit different. A little bit different for a man. Mm -hmm. A man would just a couple months, you know, he could wear a dark suit. Dark suit that he already owned. Nothing really too spectacular. Um, you might have the same morning for a parent for a child, child for a parent. Um, there were different prescriptions here, um, grandparent, aunt and uncle. Um, children, what well, we're going to see just one small uh, image of a child, uh, but they sometimes wore all black, but there were some schools thought that uh, it was very depressing for a child to be covered in black all the time. So a lot of times you might see all white. So if you see a, a photo in all white with other morning um, or post-mortem photos, the child is probably uh, associated with those. And um, then we have the different stages of mourning, which is the first which we think the lady in the veil probably is second ordinary in half. Um, and then the shades sort of decrease. So we have all black into shades of gray and lavender while in half morning. And then after your morning period, you move back to your normal. So the next few slides are from um, an exhibit from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They had a wonderful exhibit called Death Becomes Her. Um, in 2014, where they exhibited all the morning robe they owned plus some morning robe they, they borrowed from the Victorian Albert Museum in London. Um, I just want, I love these photos because, first of all, this is probably closer closest to the time period that we're talking about. And I always say you can tell by the bell. So we have the, the bell skirt coming straight out from the waist. Um, but you can see here, this little bit of white on her collar. So we, it's indicating she's starting to come out of mourning a little bit here. If she weren't, there'd be no white. So just these little details that are that go to each piece of fashion um, are really interesting to me. People just didn't dye their day dresses black. And you can see here from, you might if you, if you wanted to, but you could see it was this whole couture um, line, <laughs> I'll say, itself. And I just wanted to show you this sort of elaborate stitching on the back of this dress. Um, this is a big deal. I mean, this is this is hand probably hand sewn um, couture piece here. And I love it. <laughs> and some more from the Met. We mentioned the gray. I love this lady's dress here. Um, this is a little bit later in the 1860s, probably 70s, because of her bustle coming out the back here. Um, but you can see we have another bell here. Here's a gentleman wearing his finest dark suit that he probably already owned. And a child here, which I mentioned, they did some, sometimes wear all black, but not always. Um, here we have the bonnets, which I also love. 
Um, mm -hmm. I love that. This would, well, if you were in mourning, you would wear it all the time, always left. Oh, no. Mm -mm. Mourning was for the elite. It was for people who had money. Mm -hmm. Mourning, this, this type, this level of mourning really was for the elite. And there have there are scholars who they love and they study the um, being critical of that that you know was mourning accessible to everyone and we can see here these are some pretty this is pretty elaborate gowns and exactly another um, another sort of mourning rule is that you don't wear the same mourning dress twice. Absolutely, and I'm glad you pointed that out because that is a really good point. Um, you're not supposed to wear the same thing twice. But how women would get around that is they would have separates, the birth of the separate, right? So they'd have a, a shirt waist and a skirt that they could dye with whatever dye they could. The, um, dyes at the time were pretty readily available. They would dye it and they could just put it over their normal clothes and you know, move on. Um, but uh, yeah, it was definitely for the elite. These are, like I mentioned, couture. Um, so. Um, Again, we'll see more. I call this expanding mourning because we saw on the first slide she was carrying her, her what we think is a parasol. Um, I think this one, I would, I would carry this. I'm not embarrassed to say it. Um, I just think this one looks exquisite. It's black lace parasol. Um, but did you need it? No. But I mean, in that time. Black umbrella. Keep your eyes in black. Yeah. Wow. Um, I know the feeling. Mm -hmm. I just love it. Rain shine. Wow, that is really neat. Um, you can see this this lovely lady's enormous bow, which again, I think I would probably also wear. Um, <laughs> I just love it. I just think it's really cute. Um, and I wanted to point this out. Uh, Jay's Morning Emporium was in England or London. Uh, it was the largest morning emporium um, that that came to be. But, but there were emporiums here as well. Uh, Richmond, I found an ad for one in Charlestown that I'm actually looking into a little bit more. Um, but again, an emporium implies that you are buying a lot of things and, and a lot of people are buying them. Um, you don't need an emporium for, you know, one little skirt or one little parasol. Um, an emporium is mentions here, dressmakers and milliners, hats. Um, this is becoming a big, a big thing. I'm just going to point that out. Um, now the next few slides are um, my most recent project with the Brunswick Heritage Museum was to rehouse their textile collection. And imagine my Delight when I open up all these boxes and find all of this morning wear. Um, I know, of course, Brunswick was founded in 1890, so it's a little bit later than the period that we're discussing, but it is from 1890 um, and wonderful examples of period dress. So these next few slides are from their collection. So I just want to thank them for allowing me to use their, their images. Um, so here we have a shirt waist, like I mentioned. A, a lot of the museum's pieces are separates um, because it is later uh, in the time. So I, they don't have a full dress, it is all separates. Um, this does have a matching skirt, which I didn't, I didn't take a photo. But this is um, silk and lace. Um, most mourning pieces were made of silk or crepe, bombazine, bombazine is probably the cheapest. Um, all of these are made of of silk, and by silk I mean like pomada silk, like not like the silk super fancy. Um, it's um, kind of it doesn't have a lot of sheen or shine to it. Um, probably, well, we know on purpose it's not supposed to be really flashy. So, um, the next one we have is another shirt waist. Um, this one you can't really see, but it has lace inlays coming down the front of it. Um, it has, you know, the puffier sleeves. This one has buttons around the collar. It's not too easy to see on this slide, though, unfortunately. Um, this next one, one of my favorites. This piece here, um, this inlay is hand sewn. These are all jet beads. 
Um, I actually worked with Hayden that I mentioned earlier, Hayden Peters, to identify this as JET itself. Um, and you can, if you're interested, if you, if you do come across pieces like this, um, JET feels really cool to the touch. And you, it just, for whatever reason. And that was the first thing he asked me was, is it cool to the touch? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, likely JET. And then there's all kinds of tests that you can do on it. Um, I won't go into that, but um, he knows all about that. <laughs> and um, these buttons, I just absolutely love this double row of covered buttons. Um, and then this next piece is just a um, up close with his hands, these hand beaded jet beads. In the box with this was actually another strip of this um, that probably fell off, but you could like touch it and see it. And it was so neat um, to see this sort of hand, just artisan piece of. These were donated by Brunswick citizens. I mean, they were. There are, it's in the, it's in the archives. I don't have it off the top of my head, but yeah. <laughs> um, a couple of people had moved, they had moved and like sent them from New York. So they no longer lived there. Um, but I, I just think they're, this one you can see too, it's very dull. This one's very, very heavy. Um, and going back just one slide to show you. Now you're gonna get a, a piece of dress history uh, jargon, but these sleeves here um, are called leg of mutton sleeves and very large at the top they come down very skinny towards the wrist um and now you're all going to be fashion historians because the other word for that is jigo so that's your other bonus word of the day uh jigo is the french word for the back leg of an animal um the jigo sleeves also called the leg of mutton mm -hmm. um, named for its resemblance obviously to a sheep's leg um so a lot of times when you are studying fashion history People are, they ask, but well, how do you know how old something is if it doesn't tell you? Well, you look at fashion plates and this one's from 1894 and they're clearly wearing our Jago sleeve. Um, this was really big in the 1830s, but came back in the 1890s and lasted till, I don't know, the early, early 1900s, 1910s. Um, so we knew, we knew how old that one was, even though we did have the record, but um, we knew it, that, Whoever took it in was telling the truth that that's how old that it was. Um, so that's your bonus fashion history word, Jago. Now we're all, now we'll talk about that. Um, and this is just, you probably saw this one online. It's just my absolute favorite piece. Um, the lace is hand made. Um, I do not study lace, but there are dress historians who do nothing but study lace and they will never want for a topic the rest of their careers. I mean, you can study, Handmade lace and machine made lace um, forever and ever. And you will never, you will never run out of things to study. Um, you can see this type of lace is different from the lace around the collar, which is different from the piping, which is different from the pin tucking. I mean, this is a really, really truly exquisite piece that they have. Um, I just felt really fortunate to be able to, to have it um, there and to be able to work with it. This one's a little bit fragile, but it's um, it's as gorgeous as this photo. So let me share that one with you. Uh, so now we've talked about fashion, we've talked about all these different, the big four, um, and how they've all come together to what resembles to us a funeral home, a, a modern day funeral. Um, and I wanted to share with you, and this is just another piece of, um, I'll call it a rabbit hole, but you can go down all kinds of, of topics with mourning. Um, depending on where your interest lies. And um, I'm just going to highlight two local businesses that stuck with one thing and have stayed, stayed with it through time. So in adhering to these sort of developments and norms and etiquette and practices, they have made their businesses last, both of them, for nearly 150 years, which I think is pretty special in today's society. Um, Loft Memorials in Frederick, if you've ever been to um, he is not all of it. That's the name of that one cemetery. It's right across the street from there, from like key, around Key Stadium. Um, they were, uh, they opened in 1874 and they were owned by the same family and, and their um, employees they actually sold to their employees until about 1982. Now they're on their second family of owners, the Merkel family. They focus solely on headstones and monuments. So that just that business, developing just that aspect 
of what we know as the funeral industry that we now know came from developing um, in that period, they have made their business last that long and they still thrive. I mean, they are huge in Frederick. Um, so this is them. In in right. So, and then this is them today. Huge. You probably passed it at night and seen like the angel one sitting outside. It's beautiful. Um, but they, uh, I just thought that was really interesting. Where is the first one? What was that? I believe it's in the same spot. It's not? Oh, my goodness. I don't know. Because the only address they had was this. So I'm not really sure. That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I do know the answer to that. To the next one, though. <laughs> um, so the next one I chose, we may all be um, familiar with mm -hmm. his colonial funeral home. Um, and... Uh, 1877, Berkby and Slack, um, they began by, they were furniture makers who uh, began making coffins and expanded that business into um, into a funeral home that then, um, till about 1925, this is the Loud Museum, originally located at that site. Um, and I think it had, has had three families of owners, if I'm correct. Um, of course, the newest owner is in 2013. That's the last family to own it still. And this is modern day colonial funeral home. So they were furniture makers in 1877, but the ever-changing funeral, the evolving funeral um, that became a business again, that has lasted, they've served their community for almost 150 years. So that's, um, I think that's pretty telling that this is, um, it, the customs may have been short short to our uh analysis but their effects were lasting so i put morning in quotes here um, because i said the end of morning uh, what i mean by that is sort of all of these behaviors um what happens i mean we have another war it's far away there are um it almost seems like there's too much to warn. like there's so much so much now and we're coming out of this period as far as fashion, um, where um, young women want, they don't, they do not want to adopt Victorian attitudes of their parents. They're, it's just so stuffy as far as fashion. The flapper, you know, that whole modern woman look, the shorter skirts. Um, and that's really what um, they want to shut off those rules of etiquette. You know, they do not want to have anything to do with that. And um, I don't know if any of you love Downton Abbey, like oh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> but in the in the initial episode, she, you know, they're mourning their, I think it's their cousin who passed away on the Titanic. And she, Mary, um, she is sort of lamenting, oh, I hate black. I don't want to wear black. You know, like they just don't want to do this. This is just not their jam anymore. Like they want to be this new type of fashion and new type of, of woman. And they see some of this etiquette as just really stuffy. And I would argue that those changing attitudes about fashion are really kind of what ushers that the whole sort of mourning for months and days and however long out because people just, they're not going to do it. They don't want to. <laughs> um, but I do think uh, I put what remains, that's sort of again a tongue in cheek. Um, I think we can see all of the elements of all of this in, in a funeral that we were to go to today. Um, Uber Black. There are flowers, there's a hearse, we're buried usually in a cemetery. Um, of course, we have cremation now. There are green burials that are really coming into the now too without embalming, which is another whole, um, kind of going back to, to how we were. Um, but I think we can see just, we can see the Victorians in ourselves. And I, I think that's just really easy to see um, from all of this. Um, and I think the modern, the modern funeral industry can, can thank the Victorians and, and the Civil War era Americans for demonstrating all that they did, um, especially when we talk about money. These are some statistics about today's funeral industry is a $20 billion industry, um, and there are an average of 2.4 million funerals held per year in funeral homes. And so uh, they were making money, they're still making money today, all of it. Um, so I just really think that we can we can see those ties. We can see how how it comes to be through that. I put together just a very short reading list for anybody who's interested. Um, 
I have a huge one at home. If anyone's interested, I'm going to give you my email. Um, but social history about about the Civil War era and all of the grieving and um, and death. And it's called This Republic of Suffering by Drew Gilpin Faust. Um, that book is amazing. I love it. <laughs> um, and then a general overview of all of these things. Um, it's called The Victorian Book of the Dead. It is, um, Chris Woodyard is a, she also blogs about that same book, if you don't want to, if you're more of a, a reader of the internet. And then if, if your thing is fashion, I highly recommend a book. It's old and it's sometimes hard to find, but you can find it on like a used website. Um, the Museum of Civil War Medicine actually has a copy. You can go there to research. But it's Morning Dress, A Costume and Social History by Lee Taylor. And again, I have a huge list of things depending on what your fancy is. So please don't hesitate to ask me for more. Um, and then this is how to connect with me. I'm on LinkedIn and there's my email. And if there are not any other questions, that is all for today. <laughs>